Fighting for money is the story of exploitation. Wealthy brand owners and desperate outsiders who could do nothing but fight. It was an unregulated backwater, then incredibly niche, and then just another sport. Even if it did ultimately thrive off the intimate combat of two people. It's morning again in America. We Americans are slow to anger. We always seek peaceful avenues before resorting to the use of force. A new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. This will be a long, ongoing struggle between freedom and fanaticism. We must be prepared to do all that we can for as long as we must. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse despite corrections in the marketplace and instances of abuse. Democratic capitalism is the best system ever devised. No matter who you are or where you come from or what you look like or what religion you practice, you are equal in the eyes of God. I don't know if sand can glow in the dark, but we're going to find out. July 6, 2013, in Las Vegas, Nevada, Anderson Silva fell. By consensus, Silva is the greatest fighter on Earth. His body of work looked like that of a man who could read the thoughts of his opponents and unleash techniques that could only work in wire foo cinema. It was easy to forget that before that day, Silva was no stranger to defeat. Most notably, he'd suffered cartoonish submission losses to Japanese journeymen Ryo Chonin and Daisho Takase a decade prior. And though he came into his own and began to impose his Muay Thai-heavy striking game with impunity on foes thereafter, he had a stretch of downright bland and confusing fights long after he'd captured the UFC title. UFC President Dana White even threatened to cut him if he continued to fight to the distance on the judges' scorecards rather than finish his opponents as he had become wont to do. He ran into Chael Sonnen, a wrestler with an unimpressive-looking record and an aborted career in Republican politics. The question was whether Silva would snap Sonnen in two, as he used to, or fight like an asshole to make a fool of the big-talking Sonnen. It was neither, as it was Sonnen who made Silva look like every one of his 35 years. He whipped Silva's ass up and down the canvas before Sonnen dove into a combination triangle choke and armbar, the two techniques Sonnen was notorious for being caught in throughout his career. Suddenly, Silva was the hero. He went on to feed Vitor Belfort his foot and absorb all the fans in Brazil that the famous Belfort had, but Silva always wanted. He dismantled Sonnen's friend, Yushin Okami, in a horrifying display in Rio de Janeiro. He stepped in on late notice to face the inhumanly tough Stefan Bonner and became the first man to ever stop him on strikes. Silva clearly loved being the good guy. The Nike sponsorships and big deals were nice. But he clearly loved the fans in the U.S. and Brazil exploding with joy whenever they saw him in a way they never had before. Even though Silva was in his late 30s, the fact that he was producing such highlights well into the twilight years of a fighter's lifespan seemed proof that he would never stop. Or at least he wouldn't for a while. Chris Weidman, on the other hand, came in with a shorter story. 
He had only nine fights on his resume before challenging Silva for the belt. The vast majority of MMA fans figured that Weidman would punch air for a while and eventually get steamrolled like everyone else. Of course, those who trained with him said that his talent and aggression would carry him to victory against Silva, who had shown a vulnerability to similar balls-out wrestlers in the past. People could have seen the first round, where Weidman took Silva down and didn't let him up, but few saw him duffing out the champ in the next. It was an anti-climax. People thought Silva was clowning around and he'd take it more seriously in the rematch. When it came, Weidman beat the shit out of Silva even worse than he had the first time. Then he turned Silva's leg into jello when he blocked one of the Brazilian champion's ferocious leg kicks. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh my oh god! My goodness. Anderson fractured his leg. You can see his leg hanging loose now. Wow! It snapped right in half. Silva spent the next few years losing. Worse, he didn't lose like Anderson Silva. He didn't get blown up in the middle of some incredible technique. He didn't have unbelievable final matches with the next iteration of himself. He lost squeakers. He did once have a victory in the stretch, a drawn out decision victory over a welterweight, Nick Diaz. It was overturned when the one time protagonist of MMA pissed hot for performance enhancing drugs. Using transitive properties that never worked in fight math, people decided that now Weidman was the best ever. After his decisive rematch of Silva, he dispatched two former champions, the aging Vitor Belfort, a one-time prodigy who found second life when he was allowed to shoot pure testosterone into his veins but was forced to stop when he ran into Weidman, and Leota Machida, the once light heavyweight king going down 20 pounds to avenge his friend, Anderson Silva. Those two men were at one time considered unbeatable in their own rights. He was the next one that fans swore could never be stopped. Just like his forebearers, he was shown to be human, dropping three fights in a row in violent circumstances. Neither of the men shown here are champions anymore. One of them will most likely never fight for the belt again. The other remains to be seen. But their first encounter is seared in the minds of even the most casual viewers. It's the touchstone of this modern era of fighting, where all things that used to make the sport unusual are mostly gone, and the impermanence and depersonalization that seems to pervade every facet of our lives has finally infected a sport once thought too weird and individualistic for that to ever happen. Mixed martial arts never changed our culture, as its detractors claimed it would. There was no epidemic of children killing each other with rear naked chokes. People still commit acts of violence against each other, but in the same ways and for the same reasons they always have. In retrospect, it's pretty fucking stupid. Why would a sport of consensual violence be so much worse for us in the developed world where our governments bomb seven countries before we even get out of bed in the morning? It will always be a bit of a fringe sport, but it's got the bland respectability of the capital side that the biggest promotional company always wanted. It somehow got to the point where it became so big and noticeable that it could be assimilated by the world around it. This story doesn't begin in sanitized Las Vegas, where the biggest promotion in the Ultimate Fighting Championship now resides, but continents away and hundreds of years before anyone could come up with a term like brand synergy. The true catalyst for MMA as a sport, business, and spectacle go back to Japan. While modern fighting attracts so many outsiders of society, its forebear was the ultimate insider's art. Jiu-Jitsu, a mixture of throws, strikes, joint locks, and chokes, was developed over hundreds of years by samurai, Originally purposed for these elite warriors to defeat armed opponents that they found themselves without any of their weaponry. In the rigid hierarchy of feudalism, the techniques of jiu-jitsu were kept from those who weren't samurai. But nothing can remain a secret forever. 
As Japan was open to the world, many of the feudal codes and customs that binded so many spaces in society started to wither. By the 19th century, jiu-jitsu had proliferated to the point where one didn't have to be a samurai to learn it. But it still wasn't accessible to very many. One had to have a certain degree of size and athleticism to bring the techniques from practice to execution. That was until someone wanted something that we now take for a given in the sport. To use martial arts as a fulcrum against those parts of oneself that make them feel as though they did not belong. In the New Japan, a man named Kano Jigaro had a problem. He wanted to be the best jiu-jitsu competitor that he could possibly be, but he was just too small. Kano was the type of outsider now typical to the modern sport of fighting. He knew every mitigating factor of his identity so well that it informed his most pivotal desires and decisions. Though he attended high-end private schools and received tutoring, he was still prisoner to a 5'2", 90-pound frame. Kano found a dojo and an instructor. He tried his best. He practiced his forms, he sparred, and did everything that he could, but he was just too small and too green to beat his more experienced betters. Kano never stopped believing he had a path to victory and mastery, though. The same straying road that led such a small kid to jiu-jitsu in the first place brought him to Western wrestling, sumo, and any other grappling art he could study in order to surprise his larger training partners. It didn't matter then, in a Japan that had reformed away its elite warrior nobility. It doesn't matter now, in any first world nation, in any rich family, in a blue collar family, in an impoverished landlocked country, or if you grew up in a scientific colony in Antarctica. As long as there are people, they'll at some point want the ability to keep someone from kicking their ass. No matter how unlikely it is that they'll ever actually get into a fight. Jigaro Kano probably would have never gotten into a fight if he had never taken this path. But he had. Through the next few years, Kano started achieving some proficiency, even demonstrating the art to then-president Ulysses S. Grant during a state visit. But it wasn't until he came under the instruction of a master named Ikubo Sunatoshi that he truly found his niche. Sunatoshi was more into throwing techniques than any other instructor Kano had studied under. And for someone who was obsessed with getting around his size and strength differentials, throws were perfect. Since they centered around using an opponent's weight and leverage to impose one's will, they could theoretically be employed by a smaller man to dominate larger foes. It wasn't long until Kanu embarked on his own. Originally, he was just another jiu-jitsu teacher. He hadn't quite realized that he'd built something quite different until he began beating Sonotoshi in randori, or sparring. What Kanu had figured out was that instead of just muscling into a throw, he could apply a series of pulls, pushes, arm drags, and dozens of other techniques from other grappling arts to manipulate his opponent's frame so they'd be in an optimal position to be tossed. Once they were on the ground, Kanu could then apply choking techniques that he'd learned from different schools of jiu-jitsu. While it seems like a no-shit revelation now, it was revolutionary at a time when martial arts were very rarely blended in a way that's commonplace today. Kanu named his new system Judo. Judo is now an Olympic sport, and thousands of masters, athletes, and enthusiasts trace their instructor lineage directly back to Kano himself. Kano changed martial arts forever. His students made up some of the most notable names in fighting for years to come. But for our purposes, he had a singularly important pupil. Mitsuya Maeda became a Judo champion and traveled the world giving exhibitions of the novel art. After hundreds of years, martial arts had finally broken containment. It was first jealously guarded by the elite, then accessible only to those with certain physical abilities, then opened up by Kano to virtually every type of person, no matter how small. Now, in the first great era of globalization, martial arts were ripe to be altered and adapted. The entire sport of mixed martial arts owes its existence to Mitsuya Maeda and the whining transcontinental path that brought him to Brazil. Gastel Gracie was a member of an elite family. His ancestors emigrated from Scotland to Brazil a few generations back and married into one of the nation's richest families. Gastel was a businessman, diplomat, and as is so common in families with too much money, father to a troublemaker son. Gastel had helped Maeda set up a settlement for Japanese emigres in the state of Para. In return, he asked Maeda to teach his rowdy son Carlos the way of judo. Up until that point, Carlos had satisfied his adolescent aggression by brawling in the streets. Despite, or maybe in spite of, his wealthy background, he was notorious for taking on any comer he could find. 
Maeda turned him into a martial artist, and even the master of his own school. But that desire to take on all comers never went away. And when synthesized with the Gracie family's marketing acumen, it came in handy. In order to promote their system, the Gracies took out ads in newspapers, calling for challengers to test their mettle against the family's judo. Gostow was once a partner in a circus enterprise, and it reflected in his progeny. It resulted in a new enterprise called Vale Chudo, Portuguese for Anything Goes. These fights were spectacles, and they had no real rules outside of prohibiting biting or eye gouging, and that wasn't even really uniform. Their promotional dominance did not mean that they weren't really bleeding in there. Few in the history of Vale Chudo, in fact, bled like Elio Gracie did. Elio was another one of Gastow's sons, but he was said to have been very sick with an unspecified illness when he was younger. As such, he turned out smaller than his brothers, who were already slight of frame. Though judo was ideally supposed to work for any body, some techniques did require a bit more body and a bit more power than Elio could offer. Like Kano generations before him, Elio refined the art even more, making it more efficient, more simple, and more effective against the right opponents. Instead of emphasizing the high-velocity takedowns of judo, Elio relied on simple trip takedowns and body locks that often looked ugly but got the job done. The truth was, it actually didn't matter if Elio could land an unambiguous wrestling maneuver that put his opponent's ass flat on the floor. All he had to do was create a scramble, and that's when his superior training in floor sparring would allow him to get top position and eventually submit that other judica and wrestler without all that extra effort. Several Gracie men and their students excelled in Valley Chudo through sheer excellence, promotional rat fucking, or a combination of both. But none of them put in the kind of hours that Elio did. He quite often won, but usually after putting in a superhuman effort and almost always after getting maimed pretty badly. It was a regular occurrence for his fights to last hours, as his losing effort against former student Valdemir Santana did. In his most famous match, Elio took on Matsuhiko Kimura, a judo wonderkind who outweighed him by about 45 pounds. While it was built as a super fight, it didn't last quite as long as Elio's other matches. Kimura had been told by the Japanese embassy that he wouldn't be allowed back in the country if he lost, and he fought as such. He ragdolled Elio with numerous throws and tried to end the night in a variety of holds. Finally, at the 13 minute mark, he got Elio in a Gayuka Udegarame, or double wrist lock, which twists an opponent's arm behind their back in such a way that it isolates their shoulder and elbow joints and puts tremendous pressure on them. It was a deep hold, but Elio, of course, refused to give up. Gamora obliged the Brazilian, and he broke his arm. Elio still didn't give up, and he would probably still be there trying to attain some type of moral victory if his corner hadn't thrown in the towel. Other Gracies who took part in Valle Chudo did not endure such insane tests of will, but Elio seemed to fight for the honor of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a pretty common thing for rich Westerners to fetishize Japanese culture, and the Gracies were no different. It was just that Elio was one of the few weeaboos who'd have died to prove he was just like a samurai if they had let him. Elio is credited as one of the inventors of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. While most of these fights were grappler versus striker matchups, personal drama of students fighting their former masters or general exhibitions meant to demonstrate the superiority of the Gracie family, something unexpected happened. Brazilian jiu-jitsu had blown up, but in many ways, the Gracies had become just like the samurai who used to keep their jiu-jitsu from everyone else. For one, they restricted their most advanced techniques to their own family, lest anyone break their monopoly. Then there was also the matter of the gi. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was for people who could afford the gi, the uniform needed to train. 
There were millions of people that couldn't spare a few reals to buy these heavy cotton pajamas, but they wanted to train and fight as anyone else would. If you think Brazil has absurd wealth inequality now, you should have seen it in the middle of the 20th century. Luce Livre came from the lower classes of Brazil. They couldn't afford the enormous gymnasiums the jiu-jitsu schools would often occupy and would sometimes train in the street or alleyways. Lucha Livre was a hard-nosed sport, and its adherents were usually people who had been exploited their entire lives. Jiu-jitsu was for the rich kids. Lucha Livre was for the 99%. The Gracie clan derided a lot of their techniques. Foot and leg locks that the Lucha Livre practitioners used were referred to as suburban, it means a different, more class thing over there, and barbaric. In the 1980s, this rivalry dominated Valley Chudo after the 1982 Naja Academy gym invasion. Charles Gracie had a fist fight over a woman with Muay Thai boxer Mario Duma, and when his brother Halls Gracie found out, he rounded up his students. We'll probably never know for sure exactly how that day ended, whether Gracie beat Duma in a fair fight or instigated an all-out brawl between the two academies. What is known is that Halls and company marched all the way through the streets of Rio de Janeiro to Naja Academy, where Duma was training to settle the score. There were several fight cards built around the Lucha Livre BJJ rivalry thereafter, but the hatred wasn't confined. It often spilled out of the rings and gyms and onto the streets. There were countless brawls between groups representing the two arts as more than martial arts proficiency lay on the line. It wasn't just black and white class resentment either though. Some craved upward mobility so bad that they would work long hours and skip meals just to be able to afford jujitsu training, hoping to achieve not just money in the Valley Chudo ring, but the middle-class cachet that jiu-jitsu offered. To fight members of their own class wasn't just about defending the name of jiu-jitsu, though. It was about clawing their way upwards in a stratified Brazilian society. Some in the Gracie clan focused intensely on hard-nosed Lucha Livre athletes. Carlson Gracie developed a different style of jiu-jitsu than his forebears, an extremely aggressive and physical style that married the sheer physicality of Luce Livre with the gentle art of Gracie jiu-jitsu. The more moneyed wing of this large clan had designs past this proto-MMA, however. Though they enjoyed brisk business through their schools, Valley Chudo cards, and videotape series well into the 20th century, the wealthy descendants of a former circus promoter had determined the next logical step, pay-per-view. 